All right, so welcome back everybody. Rich Rieger, uh, Shanghai-based social entrepreneur. Uh, here today with Christine Goulet, who's with uh, the Kirin Group. She's a senior S sustainability innovation manager, and they just put off a great event on where kind of entrepreneurs, sustainability, and the work of their group, the issues of their group are being addressed together. Just had a great conversation, not just about the work they've been doing and the culture that's been developed, but also how as an entrepreneur, you can better work with large organizations who see the challenge, who wanna work with you, but you've got to be able to work with them. My name is Christine Goulet and I've been with Caring for almost five years now. Mm -hmm. um, I started in the, doing sustainable sourcing, so really looking at that tier four raw material stage, so working with the cotton farmers, uh, working on the leather traceability back to the farms, mm -hmm. and um, about two and a half, almost three years ago, we joined Fashion for Good in Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and I started managing that partnership and it just took on more and more importance in, in the strategy of Caring. Um, which also was putting together an innovation team at the same time. So for the last year, I've been really focused uh, solely on sustainable innovation and okay. leading on that front. So what's kind of the foundation story for sustainability within the group? Well, we're really lucky because our chairman and CEO, Francois-Henri Pinot, really believes that sustainability is good business as well as, as being a moral responsibility for, for any company to integrate it into their strategy. So he really does that and he's been doing it for a number of years, you know, um, to even today, he was talking about going, uh, starting the metal free for tanneries back in 2012, mm. and our first EPNL uh, was released. Our environmental profit and loss, which is our natural capital accounting, was released in 2014. Um, and I think our first targets that we went out with in in what we wanted to achieve in terms of impact were released in 2012. Mm. So it's been. Uh, even from before that, that we've been working on it. And, and so there's definitely a rich history within Caring. And I think if you were to ask sort of any employee of Caring, what, what is Caring about? You know, give me three, three words what's Caring about. They're all gonna say sustainability is one of those three words. It's sort of the thing that everybody uh, feels is, is resonating through, through the fabric of our, our group. How did that culture come about? Like was it, did it take a long time or is it something that it's just been baked in the whole time and you join the company if you, if you want to be on the mission? Yeah. I really think the driving force is Francois-Henri Pinot because it has to come from the top down that there's that this is a priority for the group as a whole. Mm -hmm. So that's really key that he this is he believes in this so deeply and is always talking about it and pushing people within the group to to take action and, and achieve that impact. That's definitely key. There is also of course a learning curve um, because these are complex topics. So I've been there for five years. This is, had started beforehand, but I've even seen in the last five years this this um, change management where uh, and learning that that the people within the group are are, are seeing um, the real benefits of the work, the real impact of it, and a real understanding of the challenges and what's at play. So now we're at a point um, where internally it's you don't have to sell sustainability for, to somebody. They, they're coming to you saying, what can I do, you know? Right, right. So, which is really, really great. And we have over uh, 60 people across the group that are working on sustainability. So within the Paris headquarters, within each of the brands, there are sustainability teams. We have a group operations team in Italy. So we're, we're kind of spread far and wide and um, have a lot of resources to be able to attack a lot of different topics. What are the mega trends that you as a group are probably most concerned with or most focused with? Because you, you have a very large supply chain, you have many aspects, mm -hmm. but what are the, the two or three that you think are the most critical to be addressing right now? Yeah. Well, I, I feel like uh, plastic is just front and center, mm -hmm. you know, with everybody. It's something that consumers see, understand, you know, every individual can understand the, the what's happening with plastics in our oceans, etc. So I feel like this is something the whole world has woken up, we have to right. <laughs> solve the plastic solution. But it's, it's such a hard nut to crack at the same time because there just aren't that many alternatives right now that exist to be able Very to, tough. yeah, you can't just walk in and say, okay, no more single-use plastic, we're going to do this. Not yet, anyway, that's still quite a complex subject to try to tackle. Mm -hmm. But that's something we're obviously really looking at. We just had a workshop a couple weeks ago with about 60 people in it focused on, on plastics and packaging. Um, so that's definitely on everybody's radar across sectors, you know, just not just in fashion, but everywhere. Um, I think the whole, within fashion itself, I think 
think the whole like e-commerce secondhand market is is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. okay. So it wouldn't really be uh, something keeping us up at night or anything like that. But in terms of mega tra trends, it's it's going to change uh, the way fashion right. works. Probably more so in, for the fast fashion than anybody else. Sure. But um, but the predicted pace at which it's going to grow is is pretty amazing. Within your group. Where are the areas of plastic that you touch? Like what are the things that you think that you can make the easiest progress on mm -hmm. and where are you challenged? Well, first, you know, whereas in, in plastic, if you're talking about synthetic fibers like polyester, uh, in luxury, we don't use as much of that fabric as, as other uh, brands and categories because we're using a lot of natural fibers. Um, so I think there's a big focus uh, but of course we're trying to use recycled polyester and everything yeah. where we are using it but I think uh, for the plastic and the packaging part um, a lot of it happens from the supplier to the distribution center from the distribution center to the retail store so this whole uh, journey of, of what's happening there and um, what are we requesting from suppliers you know even getting image involved and saying hey do you know image team if you're putting your logo on that plastic bag that's probably going to get thrown away or you're putting glue on it or stickers it's going to make it harder to recycle you know there's a, this whole education process for all the people who are along this this chain mm -hmm. within this sort of plastic poly bag and um, garment bag world that's um, where we're focusing our efforts right now and with fashion for good we've been working with them quite a bit because they've put together a plastic working group I've worked with some large brands in the retail sector and oftentimes what I find is they don't understand how pervasive, say plastic, yeah. water, whatever it may be, how pervasive that is across their value chain, and then how to address those issues. Yeah. But entrepreneurs, on the other hand, are laser focused on one specific thing. Yeah. Um, we're just at this event, it's about kind of celebrating the opportunity of entrepreneurs to really get involved and work with big organizations. Um, tell me a little bit about how you as an organization have learned through that. Uh, one of our main ways of, of um, scouting entrepreneurs is through Fashion for Good because we see about 20 a year uh, who go through the accelerator and then you know another 50 beyond that who apply. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do a lot of matchmaking, you know, first understanding what is their technology or solution and sometimes I feel like I need a physics or chemistry degree even to get there you know because right. they get so technical so quickly if it's a biotech solution or some new chemical membrane polymer you know you really have to like understand first and then there's a lot of matchmaking happening after that to say okay what is the right brand what is the right department mm -hmm. we do a lot of events where we uh, have the startups come and pitch okay. to different departments and different brands so that we can start making those connections and they're pitching for business, they're pitching to be invested into? They're, what, what? Um, well, we're really trying to pilot some of the solutions too. I mean, investment could be a possibility, but our main focus right now is trying to implement some of the solutions that we're seeing and making sure the right people are in the room from our brands who can do that and suppliers as well, so pulling suppliers in. We actually have an event next week in Florence at Gucci where we have about 50 people who will be there and we're inviting this current batch of Fashion for Good to come. We also have suppliers coming mm. so that we can really you know, start making those connections because it's really about, like um, someone was saying earlier, it's a fragmented industry and you have to connect all these dots and get right. not just the brand there but the brand, the entrepreneur and the supplier, if not more than one supplier, all together to okay. see how you can make things work. How much effort goes into that? It sounds like it's really because you've got to master yeah. one your own issues yeah. and then find the right people. What's what's the infrastructure for that? Like, what's your process? Uh, I mentioned we have Fashion for Good. That's one way of scouting. We also have our innovation team within Caring. Mm -hmm. uh, I work very closely with them. I sit in the sustainability department, but work closely with them. So, sort of looking at the innovations uh, with the sustainability and impact lens. We obviously have the Material Innovations Lab in Milan, okay. so they're getting a lot of inbound requests for meetings and, and everything as well. So um, we have we take sort of all of these various um, uh, connections that are made with the yeah. startups, and then we have a sort of a format to go through to be able to try to understand who we want to move forward with in okay. terms of trying to pilot. But because we're a group and we're at group level, you know, their their brands are also connecting with these s startups, and the key is really getting a brand on board because they're the ones mm -hmm. who are going to be able to implement it in their supply chains. So once there's a brand interested in championing it, it, it can really move much more quickly. But how much of this is really coming out? Like, wow, we never thought about that, and they can actually get it done. In general, the majority of innovations are not plug and play when it comes to. Mm -hmm the fashion sector because you often are looking at supply chain or 
uh, even if it comes to something you want to do like resale, like how are you going to do the reverse logistics behind that, right. you know, so there are very few things, it's not like a fintech or something where you just put in a, a new software and you go, okay, let's roll. And I don't, and yeah. Maybe I, I don't know much about fintech. <laughs> That's my impression. Right. Blockchain. <laughs> yeah, blockchain. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, so, yeah, I think for, for most of them, it's uh, more complex than, than we thought okay. going into this a few years ago. Yeah. Um, we, we thought we would be able to launch more pilots than we have. You've got the big problems yes. and they've got the little solution. Like how right. do you make sure that they can really adapt to your system? There are a few challenges in trying to work with a startup when you're from a big group. I mean, one is resources. Um, the startup doesn't have many resources. The group does, but maybe not available to focus on one startup. Um, you know, again, the expectations where the startup wants to come in and sell everything, and they set their expect set the brand's expectations too high many times on what they can deliver in the, what time frame. Uh, you know, if, if they say it's going to take six months, it ends up taking two years in many cases before you actually see it, or three years or five years. So um, it's a learning process. And um, I think you, yeah, you have to sort of take it step by step and not jump too far ahead. And so during that step by step process, you really need to be able to talk through with your on the entrepreneur you're working with to explain right. what each part of the process is that the brand is dealing with and what ramifications are in implementing the solution at one step in, in other steps. Okay. And there, there are also, you know, unintended consequences, like I just mentioned. And some, sometimes you think this is going to be great, this impact's going to be great, but if it scales, it might have a negative impact on right, something right. else. You know, if, you're, if they're using corn as a feedstock, GMO mm -hmm. corn as a feedstock, and it becomes a huge success, then you're taking that land away from, um, from food production, for example. Right, right. So we're always trying to think through, uh, um, in the long term, if we really do use this, if it does become the next solution, if it scales, is that still a good thing? Yeah, I've always said that some, some of the best sustainability people create better problems. Yeah. You know, like, I've solved that one, but I've created this new right. whole problem yeah. just for us to all solve. Yeah. So then, as an organization, I mean, if, if, is it uncomfortable to work with entrepreneurs? Mm -hmm. And if that's uncomfortable, like, what, how are you learning as an organization to mm -hmm. also be more open just to general, like, approaches and new solutions and within your own teams? Yeah. Luxury in general, I think there's a bit of a perfectionism. We want to have the best quality product. We want everything to be yeah. wonderful. So when you're innovating, you have to be able, you have to be comfortable with failure, which is, I think, right. especially tough when you're in luxury. So mm -hmm. there's, there's some things that are uncomfortable. That's for sure. Do when not trying to do this. the customer experience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or, or the, the image of the brand that you're putting out mm -hmm. there, that this is a high, which it is a high quality um, product yeah. and being able to make sure you're delivering on that is still always going to be the most important thing. So, um, sometimes if you're dealing with a startup who, uh, is trying something new, you know, making sure that quality is where it needs to be, making sure the delivery is where it needs to be, you know, that's still going to trump the, the innovation aspects potentially. If you were going to give two or three tips to entrepreneurs who are going to be working with you, what tips would you give them as they're approaching you? Number one, do not overpromise and underdeliver. Just be honest on what you can do. Okay. It's so much better because otherwise I, these expectations, which I was referring to before, get created and then credibility is lost and you might not get another chance. So that's number one. Number two, surprisingly, some startups feel, you know, they, they contact you, you think, okay, great. And then they sort of drop off and you don't hear from them, which is strange because you would think they would follow sort of, up. yeah, follow up, follow up, check in. You know, the, some startups are really good at making sure you're on their newsletter. You get updates every month or two or three, or they write to you when they've had a, a new funding round or a new breakthrough mm -hmm. in their product or service. And that's really, really helpful because mm -hmm. we're, we're looking at hundreds of startups and to be able, and, and things for the startups change so quickly in terms of their development. In six months, it could be completely new, the product or, or the service or business model. So um, making sure you're staying in touch with uh, people in the brands and giving updates, I think, is really helpful as well.